Hi, uh, my name is Ivan Phelan. I work at Sheffield Hallam University as a, a researcher, um, primarily around virtual reality and healthcare. And um, this talk today isn't going to be highly technical. There'll be a bit of technical talk later on in it. But it's primarily to kind of show how games can be used for not just uh, entertainment, but also for healthcare. And I hope it also showcases how you can, you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes you can repurpose it. So we have a quite small team that's developing these projects. And um, it wouldn't be possible without, without the use of Unity's asset store and the plugins in, involved with um, connecting hardware up. Um, so the project that I'm going to talk about primarily is about using myoelectric prosthetic arms and helping amputees learn how to use them much quicker. Now, we did some trials with this with seven uh, patients in um, a hospital in Sheffield. And I'll go on about that a bit later. But that's just to give you an idea of what this, this talk is going to be about. And kind of showing there's a huge potential in healthcare at the moment that there's like a lot of unmet needs that just by talking to some clinicians and talking to some uh, patients that you'll actually find, actually we're making something that could actually help somebody or we know some hardware that could actually solve that unmet need. So first of all, what's the hold up? I don't know if anybody's seen these new uh, myoelectric prosthetics. They're highly advanced. There's things like the, the B-Bionic and the, the Michelangelo arms. So they can like literally you know, tie your shoelaces with them. You can cut your food. You can do most things you would do with your normal arm. The only thing is, we have these really advanced arms, but the training is back about 30 years ago. It's very abstract. It's not, it's not really you know, related to what you actually need to do with one of these prosthetics. So we kind of looked at what was possible in this area. But after talking to some patients and OTs, we found that there was an unmet need regarding um, the training, and if you came, say, you went into the hospital and in the NHS, and you wanted to get one of these myoelectric arms, you would get fitted for one, but first of all, you have to show that you have a need for one, and second of all, that you can use one. Now, the bit of the gotcha to this is, they won't give you one to try it with, so you have to kind of somehow prove you can use a myoelectric prosthetic, but they won't give you one, because they're quite expensive, they're about 30,000. There's a lot of work getting the, um, the, the stump to, to fit, and it's, it's quite an expensive process. So I have to kind of explain a little bit about myoelectrics. Has anybody here tried, like, do you know what myoelectric signals are? Yeah? OK, cool. So the way it works is, for an amputee, they normally have these two sensors, and they're called myoelectric sensors. And they're both part of the arm here and here. So when you make a muscle activity, like, say, what a fist would be like, that generates muscle activity. And the pattern is recognized as, say, a fist or an open hand. Now, there's other kind of um, uses for this. As you can see from the images here, there's a, a little Mayo armband. So that's an off-the-shelf piece of hardware from Talmic Labs. It does the same thing as you would from uh, a myoelectric prosthetic arm, but it is a one-size-fits-all. So you put it on, and it picks up that same muscle activity. So fist. It recognizes it, release, it recognizes it. And you can send that to the computer and say, this just happened. So at the moment, this is what the training is. So imagine now you're inside in the clinic, and they say, right, put on this, these myoelectric signals or sensors and make a fist. What happens is the graph goes up when you make a fist, or like the muscle activity for a fist, and it goes down when you release. Now, this doesn't really kind of look like something that you do with a prosthetic arm. like So it's so many steps removed from the actual training. It's not like kind of experience-based training. It's, it's basically flappy bird. That's what's kind of happening here. And I sat in on some observations of uh, patients using this, and they got very frustrated. And they didn't want to do it anymore. They said, I'm done with this. I'm not going to continue doing this. Because you have to do training for a like, couple of days. Like It's, a, it's very hard. Like. And if you're born without an arm, you don't really have that kind of muscle memory to kind of remember what it is. So it's a lot of congenital amputees like. So that's where we came in with VR. So back at the beginning, we were using the DK1 and the DK2. And the reason for this project kind of came from, I don't know if anybody played Titans of Space or 
those type of games, but sometimes there's an avatar. And we found that people were kind of like going, are those my legs? And they kept on hitting them. And I, you know, a sense of embodiment. So we we're kind of wondering, well, if that works for just you know, most people for just an avatar, would it work for an amputee? Would they believe a representation of their arms in VR were actually their arms, even though they lost it? So things like phantom limb pain, that kind of stuff, like, would it work? So at the beginning, we tried with the DK1, had a great time with it. DK2 had some problems with performance, getting every bit out of it, especially at the beginning. I, I don't know if anybody here has used the DK2 at the beginning. There was a couple of performance issues, getting it to work with each version of Unity and whatnot. Um, so we got that ironed out, got working with the VR. So the idea was the amputee would come along, put the headset on, they'd be in a virtual space. The second part of the puzzle was to connect. So very affordable. We thought, this would be great. It's, we want to keep the cost down really nice. And we thought, it's worked for a lot of research. Let's try to use the connect for picking up the actual motion of the person's arms. Because you want to have uh, like all the parts of the puzzle. So you want, to, want them to be in the virtual space see their arms moving around. So we had no problem setting this up, play testing it, worked with me. You'll see some problems about this later on. Um, then moving on to the most vital part, is this Mayo armband. Now, when we came up with this project, I knew this was coming, but it kept on getting delayed. So it came just at the last moment, and it wasn't the best at the beginning. You couldn't kind of get the muscle activity always to be consistent. So you try it, and the longer you had it on, the more it worked. And also, there was this big, well, it was a big issue. There was an issue regarding, in order to, to sync it to your computer, they had this gesture where you'd had to do this. Now, an amputee wasn't going to be able to do that. So we had to kind of get the plug in from Unity, and we had to rewrite the code to kind of almost make some assumptions of what arm it was on and certain other uh, parameters to get it to kind of automatically say, yes, it's on the right hand, everything's OK, work away. And um, this also, I don't know if you've, if you've not seen this before. You can buy this on Amazon for like 100 quid. But it's, it is usually used for Netflix, uh, for like next show, or for a PowerPoint for now. You could just go like that, and I get the next show, or you go like that, last slide, or turn it up and down the volume. So we kind of repurposed it for something else other than just entertainment. So that just brings us on to the first system. So this was done around three years ago. So you can see it's a bit rough, like. Um, should play? Oh. Second now. So we just had a normal kitchen scenario, because we knew a lot of people weren't going to be young. They were going to be kind of older. They are going to be kind of I suppose we wanted them in a, a place where they'd recognize. So we made a fairly standard looking kitchen. So here you can see all the parts together. The camera zoomed out just to show. But I bet you can see that arm is having a bit of trouble there. It was because of the, the Kinect motion tracking wasn't, wasn't really great. And it was a lot of jitteriness. So you had to make very deliberate movements to get it to kind of be smooth. So that was going to be a problem later on when it came to with amputees. How is this going to work? But also, at the very first version of this, we did the, the grabbing um, of objects, just a very simple child to parent, and it would attach to the, the arm. But the only problem you had with that is it goes straight through another object, because the physics were turned off. So moving on to the next part, will it even work? So we were doing all this basically with my own arm. I didn't have anybody to test it with. So we went and we tried it out with some patients, and seven patients in general are in the Sheffield Teaching Hospital. And uh, we kind of wanted to see how it worked across a broad range. So we had people who were congenital, people who were traumatic amputees. We had people who had never had a myoelectric prosthetic. They may have just had um, a cosmetic one. They were from 20 to 60, and they were male and female. And what we found was, we put on the, well, we didn't put on the headset yet, but the first patient came in and we said, right, hooked it up with the myoelectric prosthetic or myoelectric um, armband and nothing worked. So we're like, right, that's not good. Do um, you know what? We made this VR sy system. You might as well check it out and see what it's like. It's quite cool. Like, this is back, I suppose, DKO2 was just out. 
And um, so we're kind of a bit disheartened. But he put on the VR headset and literally straight away reached down, grabbed some apples and put them away. And then he just, just grabbed everything and he was having a great time. Now, we're a bit shocked. We're like, whoa, what happened? Why did it work in the VR and it didn't work beforehand? And I asked him, was it because you could see a virtual representation of his arms? And he said, no, I just saw an apple and wanted to grab it. He said it was a lot more instinctive, a lot more natural to kind of uh, just grab and, and release. Now, one of the other things we found from this was, you might have noticed earlier on I said, the Mayo armband wasn't really working that well for me. That's because we found this out by accident. But when you make a fist, you can only go so far with it. Palm your hand stops, the fist getting any stronger. So think of it as zero to 100. But with an amputee, when they make that muscle activity, it goes from zero to 500, because they can keep generating that muscle activity. Now, the um, patient here, um, Kevin, he was um, working for uh, Bibionic, who, or Steeper, who makes the Bibionic arm. And he was generating so much muscle activity that he was shortening out the arm, and they had to put a, a lightning rod in the prosthetic to stop his shortening out. And that's the thing in all the arms going forward from now. But we found anyway that straight away they were able to do Anton in the, in the VR. So one of the first people that, well, the first guy that tried it, he said this. And I think it's kind of important to kind of note that this um, patient, he was recommended to get one of these myoelectric prosthetics that was going to help improve his quality of life, that was going to, like, he would be able to go back to work, he's going to be able to get much more use out of his, his arm and whatnot. And he said, no, I don't think I'm going to be able to use it. I don't want to, don't want to get fitted for one. After trying with the, the VR and realizing he still had that muscle activity, he asked the OT afterwards, could I get fitted for one? So that was kind of a nice story. That was, like, literally straight away after the trial. But um, it's... it's we found, like, as well from talking to the OTs, that they were surprised how quickly they were able to grab. So they went from zero to 10, as opposed to it would take a full day of getting, just practicing to get any muscle activity, just to register. Whereas here, they were going from getting the muscle activity and grabbing things. And one of the biggest issues with myoelectric prosthetics is uh, rejection rates. And that comes down to not being able to use it at an advanced stage. It has to do with weight, it has to do with a lot of factors. but we were thinking, if we can actually train people better, they can use the, the arm better and get more use out of it and actually, you know, want to keep it. And, you know, and, and prosthetic arms are getting so much more advanced with 3D printing as well. Um, some other quotes we had. Um, you've probably seen this from VR, people trying to lean on tables and overreaching. So the immersion factor of it was very big because we believe if the immersion wasn't there, we wouldn't have got a sense of embodiment. So we really wanted that sense of, this is my arms. And it's one of the things we were shocked by, nobody said, where's the rest of my body? They just had a hand and an arm. And for a version I'll show you in a minute, they just had hands, but nobody said, where's the rest of my body? They just said, those are my arms. I can't believe I'm holding things with my two of my arms. Do you, do you see what I'm doing? And we got some nice reviews, um, but they were like, uh, wanted to keep playing with it and they wanted to come back for more trials. So, this is just a quick video to give you an idea of where it's at now. <laughs> this is from uh, Channel 4 News. <laughs> <laughs> It's shaken up the world of games and movies. Virtual reality offers a dive into all-encompassing cyberspace. But back in the real world, gamers are using the same tech for something a bit more serious. To see the hand there in front of me, but not be wearing a limb, was really surreal. It was really... Um, out of this world, if you like. <laughs> Kevin lost his arm in an industrial accident 35 years ago. Now he's helping develop a unique project. So you want to put the lid back on the pot? A kind of try-before-you-buy scheme for artificial limbs. By contracting the muscles as I normally would do when I'm wearing the normal limb, I was opening and closing the hand and able to move items from one location to another. Those reflexes enable Kevin to make his electronic limb work. It's a vital decider in whether an amputee's suitable for an expensive prosthetic. But up until now, testing for those reflexes took time 
and wasn't as fun as VR. We are talking about a three-day course to actually go and learn how to use the, the opening and closing of the hand. And you would be, you, you would be moving shapes, opening doors, making sure that you, you know, they're making sure that you're capable of using it. And then you're sent away to fend for yourself. So do you want to go for that uh, coke hand? That training is even harder if you've never had a limb. Imagine that for a congenital amputee, they may have never had an arm, so what are, what are those muscles? So like, it's very abstract at the moment. It's like, imagine grabbing a, an apple. It's, if you've never done it before, it's, I can imagine it's, it's very difficult to understand what to do. Mm -hmm. Ivan's tech could not only speed up the testing, but also train amputees to use the new limb. It's proving a hit with patients. Some patients have said, one in particular said that it's been very emotional to to see a hand again, but he said in a good way. But he was like, um, and some of them just didn't want to go out, but they were like, can I just keep, can I, can I have this and just keep playing with it? Like. So I hope that gives some context, because it's probably a bit confusing where is he going with this, but I think that video kind of sums it up nicely. Um, so you can see that we went a bit further since three years ago. We got the HC Vive, and this solved a lot of problems for us. First of all, the immersion is great, and the room scale tracking, excellent. But it allowed us to get one of the controllers and put it on the patient's arm, on the upper arm, and we just had it strapped on with a 3D printed uh, holder, and it just offset where the hand was from up here. Now, we found a massive difference from using this to the old version. Even though we got good reviews and, and patients loved the old version, it was this version that really, really made a big difference. And if anybody's used the HTC, you kind of know it's quite good for, well, VR. And um, so we had a new kitchen. You can get this kitchen on the Unity Assets Store. So we got straight into it. We're, this is the whole thing of why reinvent when it's already there? So that was kind of where we came with this. And it was a small team. But I also used um, Steam's uh, lab renderer to give it a different look. And it allowed for a lot more dynamic lights. And also, it was very good for performance. And I think it's open source, so it's well, well worth checking out. It's, it's quite good. Um, we also fixed, um, a, well, we improved upon the grabbing. So instead of having it just parent, we had it that was a spring joint. And so when you grabbed it, the physics could be still on. But when you go through an object, the physics would take over. We tried to make it a bit snappy and a bit more realistic, but we found just giving a little bit of give to it was a bit more enjoyable. And people kind of never really said that, and they just they found it nicer to use it that way. So um, just going on from that then, just go back to that's the training now. And that's the training we kind of want to use. So we're currently talking to um, like funders. We have something hopefully very soon. Sounds like it's, it's more or less done but to get this into the NHS and actually make a product that's a, a medical device that we can actually make a difference. And this is kind of like where I'm kind of coming from with this talk is that this is just a game really. You know, it's all stuff that everybody here can actually, you know, get to, to grips with and they can use. But you can use it in different ways. Like, you know, you can make this as a game, but it can actually help people as well, like in a, in a different way, make an impact on someone's life. And obviously, I love games, like, but there is other areas, I guess. Um, so there is other areas. There's things like phobias. There's things like phantom limb pain. There's things like stroke rehab. There's um, rehab for afterburns, which we're working on something for kids. But there's also another one, and it's uh, distraction uh, from pain. Now, you probably heard before there's some research done into distraction for pain. And it can get up to 60% reduction in pain. But nobody's really done that in with, um, I suppose, passive. Uh, VR, like the 360, um, and comparing them against interactive. So we wanted to try and see, was there going to be much of a difference with pain regarding that? Uh, so it brought us back to Doculus again, so we went in full circle. But the reason for using Doculus was for this, we didn't use the, the cool touch controllers, we used a little remote control. Because we wanted one click, we wanted something nice and small, someone could put it in their hand. So if they're inside in the hospital and they're lying down, all they have to do is just do one click for everything. So we had to, the whole design of the game had to be around simple one click, but also using head tracking and gaze. So we made two interactive scenarios. One was a competitive basketball game. And it was very kind of, it, was, it kind of worked out quite well. It was one of those kind of half look, half skill type, you know, because the physics would take over. 
and people were just wanted one more try because you could just look at the ball, click, grab it, then power it up with another ho by holding the button again, and everything was like, you know going off. There's lots of like multi score multipliers and particle effects, and uh, we found people were kind of getting a, a little bit addicted to it and just wanted to keep playing it. Um, and I'll tell you what happened with that. And the other one was a puzzle-based game. So this is kind of more, you can see little tic-tacs. They're meant to be sheep, but it is a prototype because it's an MRC-funded uh, project, so it's to get it to the next stage. But this was like kind of, I don't know, has anyone heard, uh, played Hurdy Gurdy back years ago? It was herding sheep. So the idea was like you have to herd them all into pens, and it's like a god view, but you just move the camera around different angles. So getting to it with the patients, that we're going to trial this with. It's for inside the burns board, when you actually get a bad burn, like third degree burns, very, very painful. Like I've seen some observations of it and I'll tell you, it's, 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 re it's really bad. But what, we've, what we found was um, we had to first of all do some trials with um, students and test out pain. Now, natural nightmare, as you can imagine, but we somehow got around that. And um, what we did was had a large basin of water, ice cold water, kept to four degrees, it was circulated, and it's called a cold pressure test. And the idea is we did a baseline. First of all, put your hand in the water, see how long it can last, and you get your threshold and your tolerance, and you take your hand out. And then we're going to compare them against all these other scenarios that we've made, including, I think it was three other 360 uh, scenarios, just like normal video. And uh, we found that they were lasting about 30 seconds, and they just go, no more, can't do this. <laughs> no way. So then we tried it then again with, um, with the VR. And for the competitive, if you were a competitive person, the competitive scenario, they were lasting five minutes. And they were even saying, was my hand even in the water? So it was really making a difference to the pain. And the puzzle game, we thought, OK, this is a bit more passive, it's a bit more relaxed. This worked really good for people who weren't competitive. So even though the other one has a lot more going on, if you weren't competitive, it, it didn't really help with pain. So it goes back to that whole thing, everybody's different. So it really helped having that kind of choice. And one of the interesting things was we had these 360 videos. And from the workshops that we did with patients, they all, they all said, do calming, relaxing, just you know, calm stuff. And so we got a kind of a documentary, and it was very calming, very relaxing. But it was also the worst thing we could have put on. Because what happened was, <laughs> it was making the pain worse than without the VR. Because we were focusing even more on the pain. So yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how much it, it did reduce the pain. Um, but that's it, really. I'm, I think I'm a little bit under time. But if you have any questions, I can take them now. But I also, I will be around, and I can take them at any point. Oh. Yeah.